Okay. Today, we'll be discussing with Dr. David Ross, Nina Alperovich, and Dr. Ben Scott about their recent PLOS One lab protocol article entitled Automation, Automation Protocol for, how, for High Efficiency and High Quality Genomic DNA Extraction from Saccharomyces cerevisiae and the associated protocol in protocols.io. Dr. David Ross is a physicist and project leader at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where he currently leads the Living Measurement Systems Foundry. David's current work focuses on the development of large-scale measurements and machine learning approaches to enable more predictive engineering of biological systems. Nina Alperovich has a master's in science degree in chemical engineering and 20 years experience in synthetic biology. Her previous work in the J. Craig Venter Institute focused on the development of molecular tools and new synthetic biology techniques for genome transplantation in bacteria, the creation of the first synthetic cell, and development of a new generation of vaccine production. Nina is currently working in the National Institute of Standards and Technology as a biological science technician on the cellular engineering team, where she is focused on the development of RNA quantitative measurements and automated protocols for living measurement systems foundry robotic systems. Dr. Ben Scott leads the engineering biology platform at the Global Institute for F Food Security in Saskatchewan, Canada. His work spans synthetic biology, protein engineering, laboratory automation, bioinformatics, and science policy. David, Nina, Ben, thank you so much for being here with us. To kick off, uh, can any of you briefly explain what this protocol is about, how to use it, and why it is relevant? Yeah, sure. I'll go first. And, and first, um, thanks, Gabrielle, for the opportunity to talk with you and, and for this interview. Um, the motivation behind our protocol really comes down to the kind of work we do, which is uh, in the field of engineering biology, or sometimes called synthetic biology, uh, or protein engineering. Um, and really one of our main goals is to generate large scale data sets that will enable prediction from protein sequence to protein function, right? Um, you know, we can use methods like laboratory automation or tools like deep mutational scanning uh, to measure protein sequence function relationships at really very large scale now. Um, hundreds of thousands to even millions of different DNA sequences encoding different protein functions. And we can measure them all in some sense in, in kind of um, in one experiment. But to get to that scale, you have to be able to take advantage of modern DNA sequencing, right? Because that is the only measurement tool we have that can measure things at the scale of hundreds of thousands to millions or even more uh, sequences, right? Um, but when you're sequencing 100,000 or a million different genotypes in a single sample, you have to approach the way you get the DNA out of the cells very differently than if you have a set of cells that are all the same genotype, right? Uh, in particular, you need to be able to get the DNA out at very high efficiency so you can count accurately the, all the different genotypes, right? And you need to be able to get the DNA out in a way that doesn't get fragmented up so that you can get, you know, have good quality sequencing uh, to, to cover the regions where you're, uh, you have different sequence variability in your protein engineering project, right? Also, if you want to take advantage of automation to be able to scale up even more, you have to be able to have a protocol that does work well with automation, right? So really our protocol is aimed at kind of, you know, meeting all those requirements, right? Uh, giving high efficiency uh, extraction of high quality DNA in a method that is easily automatable uh, and could then be you know, used across different kinds of labs, right? Anybody else want to add anything to that? Um, I, my background uh, joining NIST was, was in uh, uh, yeast genomic engineering um, and, and protein engineering using yeast. So <clears throat> I was familiar with 
kind of the, the capacity for yeast to use homologous recombination to integrate really large fragments of DNA. Um, and they're used by um, uh, other institutes for, for example, building synthetic genomes like um, what Nina has experience with. So there's a really nice blend of this different expertise between the three of us. Um, and we can create these strains and, and modify their genome directly uh, pretty significantly, um, but we need these these really high quality long fragments of the genome in order to interpret um, were those uh, edits successful, um, uh, where in the genome are those edits occurring, and is the uh, um, specific sequences that we're in introducing actually accurate? Um, so uh, that's that's kind of where the yeast angle comes in. But but as Dave mentioned, this is a generally a really important goal for uh, automating um, uh, genomic DNA extraction. So the motivations were to create a protocol that was amenable to automation and would give high yield, high quality DNA. Uh, yeah. and, and to understand the relevance of this particular protocol, can you, can you elaborate on the state of the art when you decided to start optimizing the protocol? Was there anything there in the literature already that could compete or, or lay the foundation for this protocol? I mean, I'll, I'll start, but I'll hand off to Nina pretty quickly. I think the answer is kind of, sort of, a little bit, something existing. Like there wasn't nothing, right? But then Nina kind of took it and tried to take it from the place where it started, where we had example protocols that would sort of work, but not nearly good enough for us. And then she basically went through the process of making it good enough, which uh, you know I'll let her you know speak about. Yeah, but um, we also we uh, have to say before that what we have sort of restriction in our um, product. Uh, development because we couldn't use uh, like it's a lot of protocols what is this for exist for for the east and i had a lot of experience to work with that but we couldn't use most of this just for the reason because they not fit to automation like something like phenol chloroform form what needs some um existing something and 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 um, the centrifugation, what we can't use, or we can't use the bits or the mechanical parts. And also it doesn't fit for the automation, but also it's very against of our goals to get the really high quality DNA. And for the start, for sure, uh, I we start for uh, we try several different commercial kits and previously described dna extraction protocols and while they all work well enough for conventional experiments none of them work well enough for the large scale genotype phenotype measurements what we run in our lab and i have taken as a basis one commercial kit what look promising but not quite good enough. Uh, I have tried just to improve the existing kit, looking at each step and each component of the kit protocol in turn. And by the time I had an optimized protocol, I had replaced step by step all the components of the kit and create my own protocol with, with very efficient. And since you're talking now about, you know, the, the detail of optimization, can, for the user, what, what are the most critical steps of, of these really optimized protocol? Um, actually, all steps are important in our protocol. Um, The protocol is very effective because every step and all parameters were tested for results orientation. Uh, to get success using this protocol in 
automation or manual form, you just need to follow procedure and pay attention to details. Composition of the buffers, exact reagent you're going to use, temperature, time, shaking speed, everything was tested and taken optimal. It's letting the particle, which looks simply, be maximum effective. And I mean, I know that the following question might be a, a long and difficult one to answer, but as you were optimizing the protocol, was there anything that seemed quite intuitive that you thought, oh, this should work, and it didn't? And it didn't make it to the final version of the protocol. And I'm asking oh. this question because there might be a user who thinks, oh, we could optimize this further, and I'm going to try this, but this has already been done. But because it didn't work, it didn't make it to the final version of the protocol. Yes. Um, we try to use a stronger magnetic separation base. Uh, because I thought the magnetic base, what we have in our liquid handler, it's not strong enough to quickly complete the separation between magnetic bits with the nucleic acid and supernatant. Uh, we found in our base with a very strong magnets on them, and but then we tested with it, we get a bit spelled what we couldn't resuspend properly, and of course we lost a lot of DNA, and we decided never use it again. <laughs> but it's so promising for the start, you know. And the protocol was optimized and created to extract DNA from a specific species of yeast. Uh, how do you how do you envision this extending to other uh, unicellular eukaryotes or other yeast species? Have you ben, have you, you played around with it? Ben, do you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, that, that's something I'd love to test. To be honest, so I, I think the the most important step there will be the the cell wall digestion step because um, uh, yeast strains all have kind of different compositions to their cell wall. But once you you strip that away, so it's this this polysaccharide, um, that they're almost like little fingers sticking out. They're not like a, a cellulose wall like a plant cell has. Um, um, so once you digest those sugars away, I expect that those spheroplasts they're called, which are essentially yeast cells minus their, their cell wall, I expect those to behave more or less the same, um, regardless of the strain. There's probably going to be some differences, but the the cell wall digestion step, um, I'd really I really think if we can tweak that and test that on a, on a few different strains, um, we might be able to get it to work. And do you think you might have to change the enzyme that you use to digest the wall? Um, that's a good question. I mean, th there's a lot of different types of zymolase, and I I don't think they're well characterized to be honest. I think they're a pretty crude protein extract from what I know. Um, so uh, we, zymolase is kind of, from again, from what I understand, is a, um, it's a polysaccharide ace. So I don't and, know uh, like really what sugars it's cleaving and there, there might be different combinations of, of zymolases we could try. Yeah, but uh, actually the main point in this protocol about zymolase, it's about uh, mostly, uh, I used to work before because we use a spheroplasting for for other other for other protocols. Um, it's very important just um, what um, like we have T hundred and T twenty. We use T twenty because it's uh, how they how we can dissolve it properly, and in in. And, and it's also, it's a concentration, from the concentration of zymolase, it's very important how fast it will be digested. Because in, in our protocol, actually, it's important to do it gently, to let the time to remove the cell walls and keep membrane um, intact during the, before, we start to lyse the the lysing process because we want to keep our DNA intact as much as possible, and also because we add um, 
RNAs in this step, and it's important step too, because most of the other protocols what we try to com to compare to, to, to comparing with our protocol, they have the big problem, the huge problem with RNA contamination, like RNA contaminated like okay, it was four times more RNA in extraction yeah. than exact DNA. In that, in our protocols, it's important what we remove part of the most of the RNA in the first step and the, in the step of the magnetic separation beads, we remove the rest of them. Yeah. In that case, our DNA is absolutely pure right. from and, RNA. And, and Gabrielle, I actually want to emphasize here, this is one thing we really learned, uh, and I think this is part of the value of the PLOS one uh, manuscript is not just in describing the protocol, but here we learned that the measurement kind of tools, um, kind of the fluorescent dye based intercalating dyes that are you know, used to measure, specifically measure double-stranded DNA are actually not as specific as people think. It turns out that structured RNAs, in particular things like ribosomal RNAs and other things that have kind of folded RNAs can give rise to a lot of signal from those double-stranded DNA specific dyes as well, right? And so a lot of the protocols that we tried we would get the same result kind of as the published result if we did the same thing. But when we looked more closely and said, well, is the signal that they're attributing to, you know, a lot of DNA, is it really DNA or is it not? It turned out a lot of it was not from DNA at all. It was just from structured RNA that was giving signal uh, against these kind of quote unquote specific uh, double stranded DNA dyes. Right. Yeah. And RNA, it's, huge inhibitor for PCR reactions. And for us, it's extremely important to remove completely that. And you do it by a combination of enzymatic treatment and then the washout. Yeah, be but because we have the, actually we have five steps of in our protocol. It's very simple. Like first, it's a cell wall digestion and RNA digestion. Second, it's a Lysis step. Uh, third, it's a DNA binding and purification, then DNA bind to the beads, and this buffer just let the separation not only separate the uh, nucleic acid from other, all other components, it's separate by size the DNA itself. That means in a specific concentration of the PG in this buffer, they let us separate by size and we use a specific uh, concentration of the buffer when let us to stick to the beads only very high molecular weight DNA and separate from rest of RNA and all other components. Why it's so efficient this protocol and after that we just wash out everything and separate and, and just finally just salute our very pure dna from the bits very elegant and very fit for automation protocol it's very important for automation very simple yeah, and you know, as you mentioned, Nina, there there was a lot of work involved into optimizing this protocol. You change every step of, as you mentioned, as you were developing and taking, you know, what was the standard at the time, and and the paper itself is beautifully written. It's very clear. The protocol has been compared to other methods, um, and I I wonder what was the motivation of you know investing all the time in developing the protocol. That's clear, but. Then you decide to share it openly first in, in the repository of protocols.io, and then you took it to peer review uh, in plus one. And what was the motivation to, to, to do so, to yeah, share think, it? And, yeah, and I think all review. three of us probably have you know different answers to that or variations on the answer to that. I'll start. Uh, we work at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and it's part of our mission to create new measurement tools like this and to share those new measurement tools with the world. So this is really a big part of how we work. We, don't, we come up with a new technique that works really well. We don't want to keep it secret. And so that we can take advantage of the, the, my job, Nina's job, right, is to share those things with the world, right? Yeah. And for me, it's also like, uh, 
it's like from my experience uh, for any scientist who looks for the new protocol it's very important to trust those documents and nobody likes to waste time to test or improve something what they're going to use when people can uh, see the history of the protocol development, visualize results of experiments and picture and graphics, see comparison with other existing protocols, they can get more reason to trust the results and make the decision to start to use this protocol easier. Um, and, and for me, I mean, um, having Although I was involved in building the yeast strains and, and advising kind of like why it would be useful, it, it was Dave and Nina. So Dave developed the automation side and Nina developed the protocol and, and, and tested all of those things. So when I, I'm now setting up my own lab and although I know kind of why we, we, we ended up with this final protocol, if I'm going to then apply that in my own lab and teach someone else how to use it, although I can kind of fumble through the, the steps and describe the, the, the steps that, that are in the protocol without something that that's almost step by step, uh, even if I'm involved in it, it it's not that simple. Um, and I think all scientists can kind of should be able to own up to that. Like we can be experts in one thing, but we can't be experts in everything. So having a really well detailed protocol like this, it, it's been a real um, a huge bonus for me being able to teach someone and, and actually teach the robots as well how to then um, uh, use this this protocol. And uh, also, I just a little bit about, because our method is not a kit. If you try to use a kit, it's a big black box. Sometimes it's very expensive <laughs> and its work may be good enough, but not so good how you like. And then you try to improve, you don't know how to do that because nobody will say you what inside. But in our protocol, what works extremely good for automation, everything is open and clear and explain every step. If you like to improve something, you can do that or you can ask to call us and ask about that. Yeah. And, and can you mention how the feedback that you received from the peer reviewers, if any, help shaping the final version of the protocol? Um, actually, it's only one extra optional step we have added to our protocol because of the peer review uh, uh, we, we, we have added the optional step for a additional proteinase K treatment, uh, but not useful for us, for our reason, but maybe it will be useful for someone who can get something pure clear from the exact proteins, and it could be helpful for other people. Nina, Ben, David, uh, thank you so much for the conversation. I don't have any more questions. It's been really enjoyable. If there's anything that you would like to add that we haven't touched? No, thank no, you. No, no, thank you very much, Gabrielle. Thank you. Well, then again, thank you so much. Um, and yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.